am so excited to be here today with Marco Pasqua. He is an inspirational and motivational speaker. He is an accessibility consultant to whoever's really lucky enough to get to work with him. Um, and, and he's an entrepreneur, uh, a lover of all things tech that really make our lives easier and level the playing field as it were. Um, mm -hmm. And as my, as my baby is uh, throwing a little tantrum, uh, I think it's also a great time to mention he is a new dad. Um, that's right. So that's really exciting. So Marco, thank you so much for, for talking with me today. Um, I'm yeah, no problem. I'm, okay. I'm really excited. You and I have a long history, um, both uh, Rick Hansen Foundation ambassadors as well, mm -hmm. and, uh, and have known each other in the, in the sphere of the disability community for quite some time. So I'm totally happy to do this for you. And, uh, you know, this is way more than just like a professional interaction. I definitely consider us friends and, and colleagues as we intersect in a number of different things and really exciting uh, to learn that you're, you're expanding uh, your capabilities as part of this podcast and, and doing yeah. all those things. So it's, it's super exciting stuff. It's so important to have people who have your back and can help celebrate and expose each other's gifts um, and strengths, uh, whether they're readily visible or not. And you have really given me so many different opportunities in this past year alone. Um, to share my story and, and my experiences to hopefully help other people. Um, and I'm working on one of the big ones right now. <laughs> Just amazing. Amazing. No, there's the thing, my whole brand and, and I, I say brand, not like facetiously because my whole essence as a being, as a human being is about paying it forward and giving without expectation. So I'm sure I've talked to you about this in a number of occasions, but like, the aspect of what I teach people when I, when I call it the cube principle, creatively utilize your best energy is all about utilizing your social circle and making real authentic connections with people. And so if there's ways in which I can leverage my network to support you and there's an opportunity that can help you, I know that ultimately, you know, when you build good relationships, it does come full circle. There's never an expectation of somebody to, oh, you owe me one or things like this. But that's the point of meeting good people and making good relationships relationships is that you you do have each other's backs as you mentioned and um, I want to change the stigma around certain individuals in the disability community who have a chip on their shoulder and feel like there's nothing but limitations when yeah. the only limitations literally are the ones that we set on ourselves and I know that sounds silly because there are environmental barriers and things like that I'm not I'm not trying to say that there aren't however we can only change the way that we look at things and our attitude towards things. So the fact that I'm on Phoenix Attitude Podca Podcast just makes perfect sense when we're talking about attitude and the way we approach life. Well, thank you. And oh, I'm really lucky with the big project that uh, you, you just so, I'll just never be able to thank you enough for, um, for, for recommending me for, we're talking about accessibility and making this world more accessible, recognizing that accessibility means different things to different people. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's not about kind of, you know, these accommodations aren't because we should feel sorry for them or they've been through so much, you know, it's the least we can do. It's about leveling the playing field. And, and knowing that you deserve that, that opportunity, um, even, if it, even if you have to design or create it yourself um, or, or let other people help you create it um, and design it. So yeah, that's the aspect of universal design that I don't think people understand. It's not about designing for disability or accessibility. It's actually designing for everyone. And I don't know how many times I have to say that to people. It's not about making special accommodations. If you design with everyone intentionally in mind while you're building out a space or place, mm -hmm. then everyone should be able to function in the space the way in which it's intended. And as people who, you know, utilize the 
Rick Hansen Foundation sort of accessibility certification and that gold standard, that's ultimately what it comes down to. I, I work with a lot of building designers and architects that say, yeah, but is this going to cost me a lot of extra money? And it's been proven that um, it's more, not more than 1% increased in construction cost if you think about universal design from the get-go in the blueprint yeah. stage. So bringing on people like myself or accessibility consultants that can actually speak to that space, but also are people with disabilities. I have cerebral palsy. I have lived experience. So I know what it's like to not just look at a blueprint and say, yeah, that sounds good. I know what it's like to function inside that space. And when it's not good, how much of a nightmare that it could be, not just for me with a mobility challenge, but those with hearing challenge, uh, vis vision challenges, as well as cognitive, right? So we have to think about the bigger picture here because you've heard this before, people who are able-bodied are only temporarily able-bodied. They're, you know, what we refer to as tabs yeah. <laughs> uh, affectionately in the disability community, um, because as we age, um, those things are compounded and we may actually have access needs to present themselves that they didn't when we were maybe 15, 20, 30 years old, that kind of thing. So yeah. we're actually designing with them in mind before they even need the accessibility to be considered. And that's so, so important. It, it really, really is because, it, and it's, it, it can be really hard to get that point across when you're trying to make the temporarily able-bodied, you know, point, because it almost sounds like a threat, depending on, you know, how you present <laughs> it, right? Like, you better get on board for accessibility because you're going to need it um, at right. one point. It sounds like some sort of mafioso ah. thing. Like, you know, you're ah. like, let me just take you down by the fishes, you know, no Come problem. to me on the day of yeah. my ribbon cutting, telling exactly. me my, my <laughs> building isn't accessible. <laughs> it's so great when people start to get it and they start to realize um, there's a humanity towards it. It's not an arbitrary list of rules that you have to abide by to, to build your building. It's, it's those rules represent another human being um, being able to connect nice. with their, with their, with the people in their lives and their lives themselves. And, and I was really lucky that I got to have a universal design renovation done um, in my own home. And, mm -hmm. and it obviously increased my ability to be safer in my kitchen, um, to be more creative, to feel at home in my home. And, and I, I really wanted to make the most of that because I was just so unbelievably fortunate to have the means to do it that I mm -hmm. wanted to try and pay it forward by, you know, having interviews with you know, Vancouver Sun and global TV and all that stuff. It wasn't to put a spotlight on me, but, but to put a spotlight on what universal design means and, and how it affects everyone. Like it, it, it is about making it accessible for everyone. And the more we, we start to utilize it every day, the costs do go down to a consumer. Um, which is, they do. Now, how, are these renovations been done since the last time I've been to your place? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Cause that's so interesting. That would be so exciting to see that. You and your lovely wife, um, can come over for, for appetizers that I will have made, you know, from scratch in my new kitchen. And, and if then you want to go for a date night, I am happy to babysit. Um, Amazing. Well, we're not going to say no to that offer. And I got to go. be honest with you. No, I love that segue. And I got to be honest with you. Like, um, I, regardless of how you feel about how the pandemic um, has had negative aspects to it, yeah. um, there are a lot of positive things that have happened. And I'm not going to live my life in fear. I'm pretty sure you would have guessed this about me anyways. <laughs> But we as humans, we require human connection. Mm -hmm. And so there are aspects around being safe, but there's also aspects around the fact that we're doing irreversible damage to our social psyche uh, mm -hmm. by not having that interpersonal connection. And so as we're starting to see the country open back up in an effort of universal design and accessibility, I plead with everyone, remember why we're here. Your loved ones, your friends and family members, yes, take the precautions that 
you need, but don't cut people out of your life because of fear, because fear in the media, in television, in radio is always going to be there. And I'm always going to be a voice of optimism, hopefully, yeah. to be able to lift people out of that mindset so that we can move forward as a society. There's there's my slight PSA without getting too political. That I, I, I appreciate it. And, and so um, if you do come over um, for that offer um, and you do decide to have that date night, I will do my very best to, to part, to, to maybe give Stella back at the end of the evening. <laughs> I realize that she's cute. So she does, she has that effect on people. Well, and, and, you know, I've seen her in like a few videos um, and I feel like I'm starting to get a, a sense of her essence. Um, and it is not surprising that she is your daughter um, because mm -hmm. you, I feel like we're born to be, you know, a voice for, for so many people to, to raise them up and, mm -hmm. and you just do it so well. It feels like you might've been born with, uh, with a microphone in your hand um, and that little- Pretty board. close. I, I, I think so. Um, and, and so as we, as we navigate towards why we're also really here having this conversation, um, you, you were born with uh, CP, uh, so cerebral palsy. And, and when, whenever I, I think about you and you talking about having cerebral palsy, I remember you saying, um, or describing the way you walked as having like that swagger. Um, yes. And that still to this day just like brings a smile to my face that that's how you describe it. And that's how you've owned it, um, which isn't an easy process for, for people, including me. Um, and, and so why don't you talk to me about growing up with CP and, and when you might have thought, hey, I, I want to be a dad someday too, you know? Um, mm. I'm designing my life uh, and, and that, that might be part of it. When, when did that come to be? Well, wow, this is an interesting subject matter because I don't normally delve down this avenue with people, especially in podcasts, um, because they're normally very much interested in just talking to me about universal design and accessibility from like a, a broad strokes perspective, but getting to the nitty gritty of uh, my personal life. And I'm totally fine to open up to you about that, especially on this, because I feel like people need to peel back the onion layers and get to know me from a different capacity because they probably heard at length if they listen to any of my interviews, me already talk about the values of accessibility from that perspective, a professional perspective. But from the aspects of being a dad, you know, I knew from a very young age that I always wanted to be a dad. I was really excited about the opportunity to raise a child, whether it was a boy, girl, you, you name it. I, I just wanted to raise a child to show them um, that you can really highlight the aspects of empathy and compassion in this world. I think that I was really shown that by my parents. And I know that you have a very supportive family upbringing as well. And obviously it's almost like a choose your own adventure game where you, you pick a, you pick a character in a game where you have a choice to take them down the good path or the bad path. And every single event that happens in our life, you know, compounds and creates us who we are today. And not to get too meta on people, but I'm truly, I truly feel as though the upbringing my parents chose to face through adversity as opposed to letting it defeat them when obviously they didn't plan on having a child with a disability themselves and they could have taken a dramatically different road if they chose to in terms of the way in which they handled the situation. And even when times got tough, my parents did the best they could to even shield me from their moments of depression you I guess you would say or hurt because it's not easy right like of course they love me unconditionally but I'm sure there are moments and I only found out in my adulthood that my mom had moments where she you know cried sometimes at night when I wasn't around type of thing just because she didn't know what the future would hold for me and that's really hard to learn in your adulthood but it's more so about how they handled it at the time and I guess that stuck with me in terms of the way in which I wanted to approach my life, even before knowing that, in terms of the kind of family that I wanted to build. Now, there's a lot of complexities there in terms of anybody, disability or not, it's about 
if you are going to be a parent, are you lucky enough to find a partner that that makes sense with, or that they too also want to be a parent in general, mm -hmm. let alone the fears that are associated with, um, you know, being a parent with a disability. And we can get into that portion of it in, in a, a further question if you like, but in terms of my knowledge and awareness of wanting to be a dad, it was almost instantaneous, but there was a time in my, I'm 36 now. So in my early thirties mm -hmm. that I, that I thought maybe I don't want to be a dad anymore. And I, I think it was because I was letting my fears of, of not being even accepted by my own child, which sounds sort of strange, unborn child at the time, yeah. um, you know, not accepting me as an authoritative figure mm -hmm. uh, or as a father figure in the sense that, oh, I'm not strong enough because the other dads don't have disabilities. So I don't have to listen to you, dad. There's all these things that like literally don't make sense at all, but we just play in our minds. Um, because we think that's what our reality is going to be. Um, but I, I got over that because my wife, Karen, is the most beautiful, wonderful person in this world. And I can't imagine bringing a child into this world with by anyone else. And so it's an easy call. It's just like, where were we at the time in the place of our life where we felt it made sense? We're very methodical people. We're very planful people. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to make sure that we were at a space at the time of me building my business and her being in a space for what she does. For those who don't know, she's we're an interable a couple. So she's not a person who identifies as having a disability. I do think it's important to mention that because there is stigmas that follow that the looks we used to get, and we've been together for 15 years. So the use we, the, the, what we used to get when we were younger was interesting. Oh, is he, is she his nurse? Is she his mom? The amount of times I was actually at a bar with her and they'd be like, Oh, how old is your son? Literally. And that's, and my wife does not look older than me at all. She's literally, she's only like nine months older than me on paper, but yeah. she looks not, but it's, but it's the same. It's the misunderstanding that there's no way that a beautiful woman could ever romantically be involved with this guy in the wheelchair, yeah. you know? And so that's a whole other subject and topic. It really is. Yeah. It is. It is. But we are so happy we made the decision and commitment. And hey, I want people out there to remember this. If my daughter is only three and a half months old now, do the math. That means we've, con we've conceived her during COVID, meaning we must be very optimistic people about the future yes. because we knew exactly what we were doing when we were doing it. So Wow. That, and that's such a <laughs> wonderful way to put it. Um, and, and, and so, yes, there, there are going to be elements of this conversation that you know, are lighter and, and some, you know, that, that I'm also really happy to be vulnerable about. Um, and, and this is all in an attempt to, I feel weird having to even say this, but normalize um, how parenthood can really look different from person to person. Um, and, and how we, we all bring different strengths and different weaknesses, you know, that we'll, we'll hopefully choose to work on. Um, that's just about being human. And, yeah. and so I, I know that you were talking about, there was some, some question um, at one point in your life about whether you, you did ultimately want to do it because there was that fear. Um, but, but Marco, since Stella has been born, <laughs> how, how's, how have those fears kind of been uh, sitting with you does she does she make you fearful that she will be any less of uh, an amazing father that she was meant to have no to? I mean as as I said in a recent talk that I gave you may have seen the video where I was talking about it like those fears melt away when I look at her steel blue eyes is what I said in the in the talk yeah. I recently gave and and to be honest that's 100% true there's no f uh, falsities to that statement like when she looks at me and she's giggling and I see that smile on her face to know that she just sees me as dad, that's like the biggest uh, uplifter for any part of my day. And yeah. now this is not to say that there aren't elements of it that I am still uh, apprehensive about because, but I think that those are just the fears of being a new dad and have actually nothing to do with the disability aspect of things. My wife and I have done a really good job 
uh, with her being the universal design and accessibility specialist for the city of Surrey, it kind of helps too, because she's using her lived experience of being um, somebody who has navigated the world with me for 15 years and seen um, some of the complexities, but also seen the things that she knows from her experiences that we wanted to build into our space and Stella's nursery and soon, you know, bedroom essentially. Yeah. So her crib is an elevated crib, which I'm sure you saw a video of that. Like it's so that I can wheel right underneath it, make it easier for me to pick her up, not be fearful of dropping her as she gets stronger and her neck strength gets stronger, then I can't wait to put her in overalls because I'm going to be carrying her around like luggage yeah. and in the most in the most affectionate way, you know, and saying that because children are so durable. They're more durable than we give them credit for. And I just can't wait to be able to, you know, be able to be a little rough and tumble with her, but yeah. also make sure that she knows that she feels safe with me too. Um, we have a change table that is simply an Ikea desk. Like how simple does it get that I can just roll under, not bang my knees yet again. And she's right at the height at which I can change, you know, I can change her and things of this nature. And then we have technology and smart technology in the room that if my hands are full, I can use my voice to get the temperature changed if she's too cold or too hot, or I can get the blinds to automatically open or close by saying, open the curtains or open the blinds. Like I, because I love tech, you mentioned I was passionate about tech from the get-go. I have built in this sort of like, um, get smart sort of uh, mission impossible technology based <laughs> household. And it's, it's incredible. And it doesn't actually have to cost a whole heck of a lot of money, but it makes a big, big difference. So that really helps to melt away some of those uh, pre-existing fears uh, so that they don't really exist anymore. Yeah. And, and, and so one of the reasons why I'm, I'm loving having this conversation with you is because you really do have this incredible gift to present information in a way that that is light and optimistic and 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 bringing the lighter side to a lot of things that people are used to you know if they're going to be talked to about it there it's it feels <laughs> like a lecture and and so when i saw your your nursery tour tour, tour um yeah. just you presenting it as like a, a, a new edition of Cribs, which worked on so many levels. <laughs> Literal Cribs, yeah. Literal, Literal cribs. cribs. I thought yeah. that was so funny. Um, and and so uh, it, it's like just those little touches make people who might be daunted or overwhelmed by, by this subject matter just a little bit more open to seeing it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I, I, for one, wanted to be a mom for as long as I can remember. I, I really don't remember a time that I didn't. And, and I don't know why, but even as a kid, I would be thinking about how that would look, um, and mm -hmm. being just really aware of what it might mean because I have spina bifida, right? So right. Very yeah. early on, I started preparing myself. Nobody told me to prepare myself this way. It was just something that I decided to do. I decided then I should get comfortable with the idea that it might happen biologically. It might be surrogacy, you know, which is a, a potential biological element as well. Um, it might be fostering. It might be adoption. And, mm -hmm. and I just didn't know what was going to come of it. I just knew that I wanted to be a mom enough that, that however it needed to happen, I was cool with that. And, and I also thought about because spina bifida is, it, it can be passed down. There is some hereditary elements to it. Um, I, I had considered the fact that, you know, I might have a child with spina bifida and, and how I'd be you know, almost excited to pass on the, the, the tools that I had learned to make their life easier if that was how they were going to be born. And then I mm -hmm. also jumped ahead because I, you know, overthink just as much as I want to be a mom. It's just that entwine, intertwined with me. I, I like would at the age of 10 be thinking about, okay, there's a potential I might have a child with spina bifida. And, and then I would say, oh God, I can imagine them being, you know, in their teen years and them yelling at me 
because, because just because it worked out for me and I was able to, to do it didn't mean that I could, I, I, I could make the decision for them and mm-hmm. about having spina bifida. And that was a really scary kind of thought process that started to unravel in my mind. Um, and, 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 and I don't think it was coming from an internal lack of confidence. I, I think it was starting to be colored by how I w- felt I was being told by society, this is mm-hmm. what a parent should look like, or this is yep. what a parent should be able to do. Um, and I, and I was scared I wasn't going to fit that mold. Um, and then therefore do, you know, a disservice to my unborn child at this point. Um, and that was really scary. And, and I, I'm still frustrated by a lot of the rhetoric around this, but I really want to start highlighting what it can mean for a kid to have a parent who, who has a disability or health challenges, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it, because you and I've talked about this before. It's really more about the intention of what we're calling something, what we mean by it. But if, if you, we can jump, you know, five years down the road and, and Stella's starting school and, mm-hmm. and maybe some kids on the playground have never met you before as Stella's mm-hmm. dad. And so they'll see you. What do you hope Stella will say? about her dad and who he is to those people who are meeting you or seeing you for the first time who might be kids on the playground what do you think she will be able to highlight or that you want her to highlight to those kids wow that that's a real deep question i don't know if i've ever thought about five years down the road in terms of what she might say but i guess i would hope that she would say that although my daddy uses a wheelchair, he has other strengths that you can't see. And uh, what I like to believe is that my daddy is an accessibility champion. And if you don't know what that means, then I can explain to you what that means. And then she starts to point at different things on the playground because her mom and I would have definitely showed her the do's and don'ts in the playground and the accessibility features of many different playgrounds that my wife specifically would have an impact on the city of Surrey that she's actually helped with the design and concept Uh, creation with some of the people who are involved so she actually might be able to take it as a fireside chat moment with some of these younger kids and say you see how this surface here is not uneven that makes it easy for daddy to wheel around on and because that is even that means that you and I can walk on it just as easily and you see how there's an opening here so that um, there isn't a blockade on the teeter-totter that means that my daddy can roll up up very easily in his wheelchair and help me get onto the teeter-totter without there being something in the way of his chair. You know, something along those lines, like, yeah, she's five, but I have a prediction my daughter is going to be well in advance because only at three and a half months, we're already seeing her with, with the gift of the gab. She's trying to talk and she yeah. is not even at the stage in her life where she's supposed to be able to talk, but she tries to formulate full sentences with me when I'm speaking with her in very clear adult like sentences to her. And she, you know, she babbles, but we're blown away by it because it literally is like, she thinks she's talking to me. So it's, uh, we're excited about that. And, you know, I, coming from a guy like me, that truly is what we would hope that she would say, but it's not going to be easy. And there may be times where she gets made fun of because her dad has a disability. Um, but I know that we're going to arm her with the tools and the strength and the self-respect mm-hmm. to know that those are the people's issues are not her damage. Um, that people's drama is not her trauma, yeah. right? And that is, that is huge to remember that their drama is not her trauma, right? So, cause there, cause people can try to place that on you at any given time, regardless. And, um, and the cool thing about being a parent and that you're the one in control is that other people don't get a chance to tell you how to parent. They may try, oh, yes. but if you see the world in a certain way, we have this real opportunity to shape an amazing human being. And we plan on doing just that. Yeah. And, and, and what, and- I have no doubt that you guys will be able to do that. And, and she will probably be saying basically verbatim what you hope she'll be saying because she has such great teachers in her own home um, that, that will be teaching her from the get-go. There's a picture that you posted recently of her in your wheelchair. 
And it was just <laughs> the cutest thing ever, right? Um, you know, if you could have only heard her giggling, because that I, you, you can probably tell by the look on her face, but she was laughing hysterically because she loved the fact that I was sitting in my office chair and I was pulling the chair back and forth so that yeah. she was feeling the movement and the motion, and she was holding onto the belt and she like the look of joy on her face to realize that that chair moves, yeah, and that and that daddy was controlling the movement of that chair. She thought it was the greatest thing. So, oh my gosh. And, and I just love that because, you know, one of the things that I've loved about being with the Rick Hansen Foundation and doing these presentations where we're, we're finding ways to communicate most effectively with different age groups about accessibility, about inclusivity. And, and, and that work has been so important to me is when I was in elementary school and junior high and whatnot, um, I felt very isolated. Uh, you know, I just didn't know how to engage with the kids in my class because I was so used to engaging with adults and, and then, you know, not really know how to make this information and how to connect in a way that, you know, my elementary school peers could, could understand in, in a way, uh, without overcompensating as well. And so what I feel like I have a chance to do with these presentations now is to have them see that there's a, there's a kid, you know, in that yes. kid who, who might have, you know, a visible or invisible disability. Um, yep. and, and no matter what they're dealing with, the first day of school, they're all worried about the same thing. Like, well, I make friends. And, and so hopefully thinking about um, the way you guys are raising Stella and the, the kids that she might meet um, during school, during daycare, whatever, who might have a disability of their own and having someone like a Stella be just being like, hey, all I'm seeing right now is you as a person. That's absolutely a, those are such cool shoes and most likely Stella will have the coolest shoes but she'll definitely have an <laughs> she has already more shoes than I do and and Karen combined actually and actually I want to touch on something that you're mentioning here about about her ideologies and seeing the world because we live in a very um sensitive world right now where people are very sensitive and they hold very closely to them if they so choose particular labels and things of this nature in our household we've never much held too much on to the importance of the label at least in our perspective yeah. the important aspect for us and i don't want anyone to forget this if we had to choose one mantra for how we conduct ourselves in our household. It is Martin Luther King Jr.'s judging a person by the content of their character and nothing more. He would say the color of their skin, but I say, and nothing more. It's like, I don't care any of those aspects. If there are labels that you associate with, um, if you're white, black, brown, purple, that's fantastic. That's, you know, as long as you're a good person and you're not out there trying to hurt somebody and you're trying to make a positive impact in this world, then you and I can start a conversation. All the other aspects, what you choose to do in the bedroom, all that stuff, that's on you, man. That's cool. That's great. That's fantastic. But yeah. just be a good person. Be an empathetic, compassionate, understanding person and forget the rest. Like, honestly, because I'm tired of the cyclical conversations that you have with people who are so fixated on one particular thing or another, when at the end of the day, we're all just human beings, man. And so not to sound too hippie, but that literally is how she will be raised in this household. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I, I, you know, personally, I, I would hate to toot my own horn. Um, you know, <laughs> I know I'm going to be a parent one day. I still don't know what that's going to look like. Um, I just think that there will be so many perks to having <laughs> a mom. Um, not because I'm Jenna, but because of my lived experiences and, mm -hmm. and being able to teach my child the importance of thinking outside the box. That doesn't, yes. that doesn't just serve someone who, you know, is living in a world that doesn't feel built for them. That serves them in any type of lived experience, I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. um, learning how to, to communicate with compassion and empathy mm -hmm. and, and remembering the humanity 
um, in, in this world. And, and so when the world wants to be talking about parenthood and what makes a capable parent, what perks do you, do you also want to, to make sure that she gets the benefit of that, you know what, some of her classmates might not have that same benefit because she gets to live with you and Karen. Yes. Well, I, I think that the way in which we see the world slightly differently, we can't even go on vacation without seeing accessibility wins and accessibility fails. Yeah. Uh, the, the blessing and curse of seeing this, and I know you do as well, is that once you know what to look for, you can't turn it off. Yes. Uh, and I think that for her having the benefit, uh, at least at this time, she doesn't have any signs of any form of disability. So for her to be um, a well-adjusted child for all those things. However, if there is discovery that she does end up having an acquired disability or whatever the case, Karen and I will just roll with the punches, as you said, you know, and we just go in and, and do our thing. Yeah. Because that's the thing. When you realize that you're in control of the narrative, you're in control of the way in which you see the world and how it impacts you, then you're impervious to the things that other people are going to try to place on you as their own insecurities. And yeah. so that is the gift. And it's also a gift to recognize that this is a being that once wasn't in this world. And through the combination of two people, we were able to create somebody pretty darn awesome. So I think that more people need to pause and reflect, um, and, you know, and not everyone is meant to be parents. And unfortunately, some people become parents and shouldn't be parents. Um, but I'm not going to go into those things either. What I am going to say is, is that this is a gift. Um, and it really does make you realize the things that actually matter in life, the things that are superficial. Uh, like, for example, I've told you on a number of occasions, like with my life and my career, I've been building my speaking business professionally now. I've been obviously doing it since I was like very young, but I've been doing building it professionally for about a decade now. And I could have probably, you know, done some things, cut some corners, um, stepped on some people all along the way to, to be you know, more financially secure, I guess some people would say, or, or have all the riches in the world. And I just refuse to do that because it is about the journey and, and, and getting to that destination, but I'm not in a rush to get to that final destination. I would much rather take my licks and learn the lessons that I need to learn because my understanding of what it means to live on this planet is to actually be an active participant in lesson learning. It's yeah. not win er and lose it's win and learn. And so if I continue to cut corners or if you cut corners and you don't learn those lessons, you're bound to continue to repeat those lessons until you learn them for yourself. And so I don't want to try to anticipate the lessons that Stella may or may not learn. I, yes, can give her the guidance that I can based on my experiences, but I also want her to make mistakes Absolutely. because I want her to resonate with that and understand what it means, but know that those mistakes aren't mistakes. They're exactly what they're supposed to be which is her stepping into that next version of herself. If I were to reflect back on the previous iterations of myself, I would say that 36 year old Marco, the version I am now is exactly the version that I'm supposed to be. Sure, I was content with the version that I was when I was 25, 20, whatever, but that version of me wasn't ready, wasn't prepared to be the man that I am today. And so I had to have all of the things that took place and happened to me up to this time to be the man I am today, to be the best version of myself, to be a great father for Stella. And so for that, I hope she gains those same insights too. Absolutely. And, 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 and it has a sense of safety that it's okay to learn. Um, and, and that does involve making mistakes sometimes. You have also made mistakes and, and use that as an opportunity to grow yourself and know that it can be okay um, is, is really important for a child's development, obviously. Um, yes. when you have someone who is willing to be open to what comes and, and confident that with their own ingenuity, their own instincts, the fact that they have a support system around them, um, they, they will take those opportunities as uncomfortable as they are because they know they will come back stronger um, mm -hmm. from it um, and, and will have grown. 
who knows, I don't know if it'll ever stop, but to see less and less comments um, on, on social media, on, on the news and, and the narrative that creates that because a parent has a disability, that that child is being deprived of something really important. The biggest one is with uh, Rachel Chapman, who unfortunately the world would probably know better as is the paralyzed bride. Um, mm -hmm. And she's done so much work to advocate for the normalization of of living with an acquired injury, with with different physical challenges, different you know um, health challenges, and and bringing it back to the human that that mm -hmm. they are, and and she's done a wonderful job of of showing the world what parenthood looks like for her and her kid. And I certainly don't see that child being deprived of anything. Um, and, and yet there are still people who are, who are saying that. And, and well, I mean, I've first and foremost, I want to address one thing you were talking about there, which is the stigma around, um, uh, parents with disabilities. And, uh, I've said this in other talks in the past, but I would say, you know, it's about once we change the language, then we change the conversation. Right. And so, you know, it's sad that I still see in news headlines, wheelchair bound man does mm -hmm. this or that, uh, because in the journalism guide, it still says that that's an accepted term. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not physically bound to my chair. I may, I may use my wheelchair to get around, but I'm actually not with a rope bound around my chair. So these are where that type of language creates this vision for people that we can't possibly help our child because we're actually bound to our chair. This is not a, uh, a vaudeville like villain thing where yeah. they're twiddling their mustache and going, oh, we've bound you to the train track here. Like, give me a break. So we need to change the language first, then you can change the conversation. And, and yet it takes, you know, on top of that, it takes to a large extent, people willing to, to realize they need to be educated, um, to realize that they have been, they might have extreme tunnel vision about really what's in front of them and, and what really is that reality of that experience. And, and I've, I've thought about it in a bunch of different contexts. And when, when you have, media comprised of people who who are generally um who who, who are able-bodied let's say like who don't have that lived experience it almost when they when when the the language has been created to to include like wheelchair bound or or something sufferer uh it it mm. almost to me makes me wonder if it's coming from a place of fear um and and oh, that no that's 100 what it is i jenna you know i don't want to get too deep into this but the media is paid to sell fear yeah. uh the 99 of the media is paid to sell fear it's like not wanting to look away at a train uh, accident right um they know that that's what sells and unfortunately i have worked my entire life to flip that narrative to understand that when you have the opportunity and you are on that soapbox you don't have to sell fear. Yeah. You can sell optimism. Yeah. You know, it may not pad the pockets of, of big companies as much as keeping people in fear so that they can continue to buy your healthcare products, your, your self-help books, your all, and you probably can relate to this as a counselor because of all the things you see of people suffering with mental health challenges as a result of the fear that they're constantly living with in this world. But if it's up to you and I, people like us to change that narrative, the second that you change that is the second that we can start living harmoniously. I know that that sounds fluffy to some well, people, it but it's real. It doesn't, and and it makes me it make obvious. It, it makes me a lot of things, but it makes me sad because I worry that they're using this language because that's how they would see themselves in that situation.
I, I actually almost yearn for those opportunities yeah. because it helps That's to true. help to filtrate your life in terms of the people that are worth keeping around in your life and who is really there for you when you're in your lowest moments. Yeah. And also how you're able to climb out of that circumstance because you've been faced with the bottom of the bottom of the barrel, you know? So to be honest, that's why I like the challenge of continuing to crawl my way up and really showing people that their perspectives are only their perspectives and that I can shatter barriers any single day. Just give me, just give me the opportunity to. And, and, and it's, I feel like what we know is, can also be like, it's temporary. So, um, so I, I took forever to finally decide to do the universal design renovation for my home because I just thought it wasn't going to make a difference. It wasn't, it was, or, and it was also kind of admitting that I couldn't do things the way that everybody else did. So, mm, so that was hard for me. And that was my own journey. It wasn't that I wasn't given the support a long time ago to, to make that happen, that project happen. But I still wasn't ready to potentially have, a, you know, meet society's idea of what I could and couldn't do. And so what was funny about this though, was I just thought I was naturally a bad cook. Um, <laughs> and and I, I was almost a toxic cook. And, and then I had the renovation done. Marco, I'm a gourmet cook now. Apparently, wow. I'm not a bad cook. It was just, I was trying to make things work that didn't work for me. And you didn't have the tools at your disposal. I, and I didn't realize the, the heights I could reach um, when I finally said, hey, my admitting the fact that I need to have my kitchen renovated um, isn't feeding into this idea that I am lacking in, in my ability to use my kitchen. And, and that's all because it's spina bifida and boo hoo hoo. Um, I, I got it done and, and I'm like, holy smokes. I, I, I finally started realizing I hadn't integrated the whole, it's about leveling the playing field. Yep. And and when I did that, I couldn't believe what I could do. I was doing beef wellingtons. I was doing roast chickens. Like I was getting known for my cooking. And, and my goodness, so, I'm going to call Gordon Ramsay and get him over there to test your beef he wellington. Cry. He would make me cry. He would make me cry. <laughs> no, no, I even, you know, earlier on when I was starting Phoenix Attitude, I said, oh, go on, uh, go on uh, Shark Tank or, and Dragon's Den or whatever. I was, I was like, no. O'Leary's going to make me cry. <laughs> like, this is oh, the- I'm sure. I'm sure he's a pussycat in all things considered, you know, wow. it's one of those things. Uh, but, but no, I'm so glad that you felt liberated through yes. your experience of discovering that um, it is not, it is not a helping hand. It's not a handout. You're getting a hand up to what was possible, your potential. Yeah. Right. And I know that that sounds like something you'd see on a poster, mm-hmm. but, but the, the reality is, is that no, if you're given the right tools and the right space to live your life meaningfully and fully and, and discover new skills about yourself, then you'll probably surprise yourself. And yeah. this is where living that, like you said, converting your home universally now also opens up another field of opportunities, meaning you can invite the media to your home and show yet another aspect of not fear, the yeah. positivity, the change of which, you know, takes place when you empower yourself. And that's huge. Yeah. And, and so I, I, I always love the expression, like leveling the playing field. So speaking of playing, um, it's only been, okay, you can probably speak to this a little more concretely than I can in terms of how long it's kind of been in existence. Um, but the accessible playgrounds that are now mm-hmm. around, I, I remember finally having, or having access to one when I was volunteering at Canuck Place. And Mm -hmm. so I was in my early twenties. So I never really had an independent experience or, you know, those memories of being on the playground by myself. I, you know, always had to either be carried or really have it facilitated um, by my parents. And, and I remember, I just, 
something deep inside of me always just like yearned to go on that thing that like spin merry-go-round well yeah without the horses though like you hold on right right right. it's like the yeah the carousel or whatever they call those things yeah and and oh my god so i i i I got to see that accessible playground for the first time in my early 20s and i'm supposed to be you know there in a professional capacity um (laughs) And, and, uh, that, that went out the window when I saw that. And another, another friend of mine was volunteering at the same time. And, and I said, I want to go on that. And so, and this is the first time I could. So I wheeled on it because it was flat, like it was level to the ground. And my buddy who was also supposed to be there in a professional capacity, but couldn't deny me this, you know, started to spin me like all the other kids used to do. Right. Yeah, and yeah. I was having the time of my life, but Mark, you don't have, we were having so much fun and I was going so fast that the, that the treads actually peeled off of my wheels, like the rims. What? Um, it was, I was going that, I was like a little mission impossible. I was making up for that lots is of time. Intense. It, it was, but it was so worth it. Um, and I, I now know that when I have my kids, um, whether they have, you know, spina bifida or something else or, or nothing at all. Um, I will be able to enjoy those memories and be a part of those memories myself because I'll get to go as a parent um, and make use of that accessible playground um, so that I don't have to miss those, those beautiful moments um, from my kid's childhood. And so I, I just think it's so wonderful that it's not only helping the kids, but it's helping parents, which who, who are in, you know, who, who need the accessibility as well. And I don't think people think about that a lot. Um, well, I do simply because I don't know if people know, but I actually live in Surrey, British Columbia, very close to Vancouver. And we were once known as the city of parks. There's over 200 parks in Surrey. Mm-hmm. And, um, and one of the parks we have is called Unwin Park. And Unwin Park was one of the Canadian tire accessibility parks that was installed with the full, as you described, rubberized mm-hmm. surfaces that you can wheel on. Uh, the carousel that is flush with the ground. So there's no threshold there. Um, But we didn't even get into things like sensory friendly spaces, tactile touching spaces, um, braille, so that individuals who are um, who have vision loss or who can read Braille um, mm-hmm. at a young age can be taught that parents can come there, teach their kids Braille, can teach their their kids um, uh, color theory and that kind of thing. So, like to me, it's all encompassing. It's not just about oh, we can jump on a swing or a carousel now. It's mm-hmm. so much more about integration of all children, and that is really darn cool. Yeah, it really, really is. Um, so I'm really excited about how life is unfolding in that respect and, and that there are people like you and Karen, um, who, who are really using your voices to, to show that this is, this should be normalized. Um, this isn't, this isn't about giving people that participation award. Um, this is about creating a world that works for everyone and mm-hmm. and we all end up winning in a way um whether we see it immediately or not or we see it impact our lives immediately or not um and and so that makes me really excited about about the future and and how i can shape it as an individual and hopefully one day as a parent well, there are huge things coming down the pipeline. You have every right to feel optimistic about the future. It's been a little bit shaky for the past year and a half or so, but I actually think that through adversity, we come through even stronger. And I really see some massive positive changes coming down the pipeline on a technological front, on an emotional front, but on a humanity front. I really think that you're going to be blown away at some of the things that are going to be unveiled in the news, in the media, in positive technology moving forward within the next even couple of years. And I can't wait to, to be a part of that journey and to be a part of that ride, um, you know, because I, I think we're just getting started, right? I, I honestly think that um, we have the potential to really bring this thing forward, right? And so 
um, yeah, there's definitely going to be some amazing, amazing uh, unveilings uh, in the next little while. And I, I'm excited to be part of it. I'm excited to be a part of it. And also ju jumping back to your project you were talking about, I know you were referring earlier to um, the project that you're supporting with, with Access Now on our friend uh, Mayan Ziv um, out of Toronto. It's like doing incredible that. things. Yes, yes, absolutely. Did you guys have a conversation? Like, um, let's let's give them a little bit of a plug here at the end here, because yes. I want to make sure that people know what, what's going on with that. So, you know, five, six years ago, she she is a wheelchair user and and she was really getting frustrated by the fact that she wasn't able to connect with the people in her life uh, socially as as much as kind of anyone else. Um, because of accessibility and those barriers. And, and so, especially in Toronto, I might add, because they have the raised uh, sidewalks due to snowfall that we don't have in, in uh, the greater Vancouver region. So I want to, I want to preface that. Yeah. And I grew up in Toronto and, and I think that that was also something where, because it, it just felt so inaccessible, I, I, was defeated for a long time and kind of thought this is the way that it is and and you have to pick your battles um otherwise it feels like you're fighting all the time and and so what she ended up doing was was you know creating access now and 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 they have the app so you have the opportunity it's a public app you go in and you can review where where you are right now, whether it's like a restaurant or a cafe um, or a store, um, based on its accessibility and the um, accessible environment that it mm -hmm. provides to its customers, ultimately. And, and it has really grown to make the point that accessibility means different things to different people. And, and the app represents that. So what you can do is you open up the app and, you know, yes, there is the opportunity to kind of give immediate information using tags um, to say like wheelchair accessible bathroom or, you know, accessible parking type of thing. But, but something that I think is just so pivotal when we're, when we're educating people about what makes something accessible is there's that opportunity to have that text box so that you can write specifics. Whether based on that information, it would work for them. This might be- Should they even leave the house? You yeah. know, should they even bother to go yeah. to that location and spend the time commuting there only yeah. to discover that the owner's definition of accessibility doesn't actually work for the way they see the world, right? So- Exactly, and, and it felt yeah. like, and, and, and to avoid that happening, I don't know about you, but it always felt like to me, I had to write a book report uh, yep. or I could go anywhere new. Um, and, and originally it was kind of just hoping it could be a, are you, you know, an accessible restaurant? And, and, you know, back then they all had different ideas about what that meant. And some people just weren't educated enough and might say yes, and it wasn't, or, or would lie or, or whatever, right? I started having a list of questions that I would ask and, and boy, some of them would just seem so obvious that I'd get a little bit of attitude for even asking it. And, and it's just like, okay, you know what? I know this should seem really obvious, but I have these questions because I've run up against it. Um, yes. And, and it is so much work to make sure that when I'm investing my time and energy getting somewhere, to potentially have, you know, a, a wonderful experience connecting with people in my life, I, I want to make sure I can actually enjoy it when I'm there. And now to have an app like the Access Now app, you're mm -hmm. able to see what other people have said, read the accessibility, whether, you know, you, you do have um, mobility needs that you need to take into consideration, whether it's visual, whether it's auditory, whether it's, you know, how much stimulation you can take in. Um, totally. It, totally. It, it, it's so different to different people. That information is, is power to other people and it doesn't have it to is. be a, you know, black and white accessible or not. 
And we're, we're trying to arm people with that information and give them that agency to know it's okay to, to need certain things and to ask for them and, and, and to make a decision based on that information about how you want to spend your life. So we're <laughs> hoping to start that mapping project uh, beginning of August. Help with that pinning project. So I know this is your show, but I, I, I feel like, you know, we would be remiss to talk about all of this and not talk about the opportunity if they are still looking for recruits to get involved. Yeah, so um, this is also not just happening in Vancouver this summer. Um, Access Now has put bravery to a whole new level and, and decided to have this mapping initiative happen in Vancouver, Calgary, and Ottawa. And so Vancouver is still um, interviewing if, if uh, anybody is interested in learning about how they can be involved with that mapping process and, and be a part of history really. Um, because mm -hmm. as Mayan said, um, when she was uh, a part of a Google startups conversation, she, she was making the point that, you know, after this summer, there's gonna be more information surveyed, re-accessibility mm -hmm. and, and, you know, entered into this like database and, and available to people than there ever has been before. Um, and, and, and it still kind of just doesn't feel real that I get to be a part of that. Um, and, and so, yes, I still want to see if there are people who want to be a part of history and if I can help support them do that by, by being a part of the Vancouver team. Um, we are, we are, kind of closing up soon and finalizing teams, but we're, we're not done. So we're <laughs> hoping to start that mapping project uh, beginning of August. Amazing. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad you, you took uh, the bull by horns. You took the opportunity to uh, say yes to something really cool. Uh, I'm glad that it made sense for you at this time in your life as far as being part, as you say, of history. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I'm so excited to see what happens with that project and I just with continual access champions. You know, man, man and I have had opportunities to intersect in the work that we do for years now, um, whether it, we're both uh, change agents through Microsoft um, and, and various other opportunities. But as more and more companies are getting on board, whether they're big name companies or not, mm -hmm. the important aspect, I think, is the people behind um, behind all of that, um, because you can make incremental changes on a small scale to make a huge impact. I think that ultimately is part of the message that I'm trying to say here today in this interview that you're giving me, uh, is essentially, um, regardless of your perspective in life, we all have something to give, whether that's through parenting, whether that's through universal access, whether that's through none of those things at all, but it's on our own journey that we're willing to be vulnerable and share. And I encourage everyone to get a little bit more vulnerable in our life because we only have a short time. We only have a short time to make that impact while we're here. And I want to be remembered for the things I was able to do, not the things I wish I had done. Right. And and I don't think you're alone there, but it's still it's still a scary thing to to commit to and hope you can you can say at the end of your life, I I put myself out there as much as I absolutely could and thank God as scary as it was um, or as impossible as people said it was going to be. Um, it, it's really important if you can to see how this world works for you as opposed to taking other people's word for it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and when you have that opportunity, you know, see what you need to do to make it your own. And, and, if it, and if it looks different, that absolutely does not take away from what you're able to accomplish. Um, so yeah, yeah, at the end of the day, just get out of your own way sometimes. Absolutely. That's perfect. I think that's a great way to end, to end the yeah. sentiment of what we're doing here today. Yeah. But um, thanks so much for the opportunity to be on your podcast. 
um, and to, to talk about what it is that we're talking about. I think that very few people open up in the capacities that we've been able to do in just over an hour here. Um, so th thank you for giving me a platform and an avenue and a space um, to share that uh, with whoever will be willing to listen. So thanks. And thank you for, for giving me these opportunities that give me a chance to make the decision to say yes. <laughs>